So you're going to tell me the story, Danny, behind this table. So my neighbor across the, uh, the hall was selling this table, and I needed a table. And I was like, man, this will be great. And I saw it in his place. It looked great. And so my buddy Gary and I went over there to get it, and we went to pick it up. And it's so heavy that you cannot even believe it. And we didn't know how, first of all, how we were going to get it out the door. And how the heck did they get it into this building, first right. of all, is what I wanted to know. Uh, but anyway, we, we took, I had an old um, longboard, a skateboard, really long. And we bought it over there. We leaned this over. We put it on the longboard, balanced it on there, and just rolled it across the hallway and jiggled it and jiggled it and jiggled it until it got into here. And it's not a bowling alley, although it does appear it, to I be. mean, it could be. It could, I mean, it could be an old, it's not as, yeah, no. It shuffleboard, be good to hit that board. maybe. Yeah, that would be that would be awesome. Yeah. So you're getting ready to go to Bonnaroo tomorrow? Yeah. So thank you for taking the time to sit here and talk. I appreciate you having me. How many years you been doing that? Uh, what, what year is this of Bonnaroo? Is it 15? 14. Wow. So what, what is 14 what, years? <laughs> what do you do? What is your role? Um, it's interesting. I started um, Jonathan Mayers, one of the Superfly guys. Um, I think he had seen the work that I did with um, the Beastie Boys for the concerts for a free Tibet that they had put on. And I did a book of photographs. And um, what had happened was my friend Shelby Mead invited me out to these concerts and said, in exchange for an all access pass, would you share your photos with us for the cause? I said, absolutely. And I said to myself, I always wanted to do like a, a portrait, like a Irving Penn style, uh, world in a small room portrait area, natural light kind of thing. And I never thought she would agree to it, but I asked anyway. And she said, sure, bring it on. So that was in like 96 or something and I built my first natural light portrait tent at a festival um and the lineup was amazing um Foo Fighters Beck Sonic Youth Biz Marquee you know Tribe Called Quest I mean it was just like it was an amazing amazing bill and then every year uh, after that the four years they did it I did these portraits so Jonathan had seen the portraits and was they had started this festival uh called Bonnaroo and he invited me out to photograph and do a little portrait setup. So that was my first year. Um, the second year, he decided that um, he wanted to make a film about the festival, um, more a concert film uh, type of thing. And this is pre-digital everything. So we shot the concert uh, and we made um, a film called 280 Miles to Graceland. To, it might be 280 Miles from Graceland. <laughs> and we shot it all on film 16 millimeter super eight um it was kind of like my ode to uh, jazz on a summer day um very um musical abstract uh you know segues in between the imagery no talking head interviews or anything like that um and so i did the portrait tent uh and i did this film uh, and the same with the next couple of years, I would do the portrait thing, I would do the film. Uh, and it grew into a certain, sometimes it was like, I do the portrait thing, then I'd be creating content for uh, something, someone like Fuse. And I remember this one year, I was doing a, uh, a portrait, my portrait thing, which I do every year. Um, I did some content for Fuse, I believe. And the band I play in, the Tangiers Blues Band, played the festival. Nice. So, so you were pretty busy. I was like, it was all came full circle. It was really, really fun, and we had a blast. And um, and uh, I've done so much content. I've been doing the Super Jam uh, films for them for years. Uh, last year, we did uh, Skrillex mm. um, with a great bunch of people, um, Janelle Monet and um, uh, um, Matt from Cage the Elephant, uh, uh, Robbie Krieger from The Doors. Um, uh, 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 Damian Marley. Uh, it goes on and on. It was really, really deep and really, really fun. And before that was um, one with um, Jim James and Brittany from Alabama Shakes. Uh, John um, from um, Hall & Oates. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> John Oates, what a great guy. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, as you uh, from from a musical perspective and a fan perspective, I'm a big music fan. And sometimes you kind of dismiss some of these folks who you've heard like, oh, yeah, you know, Hall and Oates, uh, you know, I'm sure he's a great guy and he's super, super cool and we met him and stuff. And I mean, that guy is no joke. I mean, they're, you know, they're Hall and Oates for a reason, you know, <laughs> these yeah. people who have been around for years. Uh, it's kind of like the blues artists when the blues artists come around and, you know, they're still doing it in their 80s and they're still as authentic and as cool and as badass as always. And I, I, I think that people should respect that about music in any genre, you know, that people have grown and they've lived life and they're, you know, they're, you should learn from what they have to offer. Absolutely. So after 14 years of doing that, the Bonnaroo, um, how do you keep it fresh? How, what, what's your take on keeping something fresh? Yeah. Well, if you look through the years of Bonnaroo, um, it really started, I think the first year I may have had two flats put together in a V and then I was like putting black fabric here and there and white bounce cards. It was all ambient light yeah. was the idea. And now it's grown to like 20 by 20 silks with um, flats on the side that you can pull back to open up light. Oh, I need a little more light here. Let's open this. Let's pull the front up for some fill, you know, and that sort of thing. And, um, and a couple of years I've done a white on the back side of the portrait area. I've done a white thing with natural light white. And um, so Dan and I, um, it, you know, my assistant, were kicking ideas around for this year. And I, I saw something that was really inspiring to me. It was just a very simple portrait of someone that was lit um, from the top, very toppy light um, and a black background and just the simplicity of it and the light coming from that angle. So we're going to we're splitting the, the area up into two this year. So it's going to be the black on black. It's going to be the the black set where I bought um, I painted chairs and tables black. And um, and then there's going to be a white set. And I think for the first time ever, I'm going to I'm going to use a strobe for the white set. Like mm. I will have a certain idea of how I want it to look, how I want it lit. Uh, and the idea that I have for that um, is interesting as well. And um, so if you look through the years, you'll see sometimes I painted the walls. I put some wallpaper up sometimes. Sometimes it was white. Sometimes it's gray. Sometimes it's a wood floor. Sometimes it was a backdrop. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't stray too far from the simple idea of a portrait right. and, and the relationship and the moment that we can build together with the subject. Yeah. No, that's that's cool. And it, yeah. before we started, you were showing me the kind of like the toy box, all the different styles of cameras. And, it, you know, I know over the years, it has to get tough to, you don't want to do the same thing over and over. So it seems like you've been experimenting all along. I have. I've always been a fan of, uh, of, of the document, first of all. I love the document. I love Danny Lyon. I love Robert Frank. Um, you know, and then there's Avedon and Penn and the Masters, you know, Mary Ellen Mark, yeah. uh, God bless her, who I worked with also for a couple of months. And... Um, and I've also been a fan of really outside the box things that are more artful and, you know, and, and the thing that I feel really fortunate about as a photographer is that I've been doing commercial photography for years only with musicians. Right. So, and musicians, there's no rules in their mind, you know, and it's been such a great thing for me to be able to do the document in one respect which is, you know, simple. It's about the moment and the atmosphere and, and that sort of thing. But then to also take a camera like a, like a Diana, an old 50s plastic camera, and put it on bulb and do a triple exposure, you know, I started to dig through, like, what camera could I find? Oh, a half frame. Shoot a half frame in a way that, like, if you combine three of the frames, it becomes something interesting. Yeah. You know, shoot. Um, you know, sometimes I'm in a situation where, I'm in a hotel and I get like 20 minutes with someone in a hotel room and you go in there and you say, okay, well, I've got my ideas, my fallback ideas, and I'm going to go in there and see what happens. What does the artist have there that I could use for the photo shoot or what, um, what, what can I bring to the table with the cameras that I have? 
And sometimes you can be beating it up with like your Hasselblad and you're trying to get it and it's just, well, for whatever reason, it's not working. And you take your Holga and you do like a triple exposure and it's kind of weird, but at the end of the day, it's like you're there to get one great image and it's a happy accident happens for sure. some reason. Or I take my Wydalux and, you know, I put it on slow and do a little something or, you know, you get someone in the frame who doesn't think they're in the frame. And, you know, for me, I'm like, I'm looking for a little surprise and a little discovery. So and, the, it's um, all part of the game. Yeah. I mean, for you, it's, it's, it's that capturing that moment. And it's just, I mean, that is the fun for it. It is like a game for us to, to go out there, visualize, pre-visualize what you want to capture. And then the challenge of being put into, because one of the questions I had written down and I rarely look at my questions, by the way, is, um, the mindset, do you get into a different mindset when you're shooting? You know, because there's, there's a times where you're just joking around with people, joking around, and then the shoot comes along. Do you get into like a zone? I try to keep a flow going. That's my, my way of working is I want everybody to be relaxed. I want it to feel like a hang. And uh, I mean, I'm, I work as hard as anybody, I guarantee it. Yeah. But I still like it to feel like I'm maybe not working as hard. You know, and uh, and then sometimes I feel like I want to work hard and we connect on that level of like, this is working. Let's work hard at this and make it great. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's like putting on some great music and trying to distract people a lot of times. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you're doing a cover and it's about like, you know, looking right at the camera and like keeping it simple and that sort of thing for like a magazine or something where you have a. Um, a concept where you need space around the artist or you're shooting something and you need to have a gutter because you know if you're doing an, uh, a spread right. and they ask you, hey, we want to run a double page spread, well, you don't want to put the person in the center of the frame, exactly. of course. So those are things that are going through my head. But more and more, when I'm done with a photo shoot and someone says to me like, oh, that was, man, that was great. That didn't even feel like we were doing a photo shoot. I feel really good about that. So you think that's how you've been able to work with musicians so well? Because you're a musician... It's, it's, it is about the hang. And that's what, when, you, when you've toured, I mean, I've toured and worked with a ton of people, not as many as you, but they're just people and they just want to hang out right. and just have a normal conversation. And that's where the candidates come to life. Right. And, the, and those are the, the documentary, like you look at Jim Marshall's work all of those years. And I know you, you knew Jim and it's just that stuff. Just when you look at his books, you sit there and you go, yeah, he knew what he, he was capturing because he, he was part of everything he was yeah. doing. And, and those guys were, there are some people who are there and took photos, and there are some people that are there and took great photos. And Jim Marshall was definitely taking great photos you oh, know, yeah. with the opportunities that he had. And I've talked with people about what's different today in photography. Like, oh, you know, you, you were, you know, it was different when you were coming up. Like, you know, it's harder now kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, you know, I've talked to, and I, and I, and I know a lot of the great rock and roll photographers, um, Mick Rock and Henry Diltz and Bob Gruen and Lynn Goldsmith and like all these people um, who really, I know for a fact that they started out because they loved taking photographs and they were hanging out with their friends and yeah. they were getting these opportunities and getting $25 from a teen magazine or something to to shoot this stuff. When in fact... You know, they never thought that they were actually going to make a living at it. And, and so the point to take away from that is the idea that if you're passionate about something and you love it, just go for it and the rest will come. Don't try to make the money come first because it's oh, not yeah. going to happen. Yeah. Well, especially know? with music. Yeah. I mean, today it's like, yeah, it, it, it is. You can say it's harder today, but I'm sure the people were saying it was harder then as well. Yeah. And it's it's just what are you doing to be different to stand out? And it seems like the access is where it's at. I yeah. mean, you just ask. And we, I've said this a million times to everybody. They're like, how did you get access to do this and this? You ask. And you don't know how many emails I get back. And people are like, I just called these people and asked to do it. And they were like, yeah. I mean, what do you have to lose? I mean, it's, so, so for like you, that. where'd like your that. your access come from? Did, did it just come from asking? <clears throat> yeah. and um, And word of mouth working with people and them saying like, Oh, uh, you know, this one woman I spoke of earlier, Shelby Mead, she started, um, at Electra, I believe in, in, uh, in hip hop mm. and her and I met and we, you know, she was like, wow, I really like your style. I was young. She was young. 
And uh, she kept saying to her boss, you know, like, you should have Danny shoot something. And then I ended up shooting Pete Rock and CL Smooth for her. But then as time went on, she would recommend me to other people because I did a good job on that shoot. And then she moved on and then she was working with, you know, the Beastie Boys and the Foo Fighters and all these people. And then, you know, her and I are like, we're like family, you know, so she trusts me. And so she knows she can bring me into the fold with these bands. Yeah because I've, I've shown that I'm capable of keeping my cool, staying out of the way, respecting other people's space. Oh, yeah. You know, all those things that are really important. Um, I also, uh, there's a story I've told a bunch of times. Um, I'll try to do the Cliff Note version of it, where I was here in New York City shooting as many shows as I could, getting, getting my time in the pit uh, here and there, different shows, whether I was at, Irving Plaza, whether I was at, you know, summer stage in the, in there or at the garden, I always saw the same guy uh, in the pit, this guy, Daryl. And I'd run by him and I'd be like, hey, man, you know, good to see you. You know, I'd go shoot my show and we'd have a little small talk. And one day I said to him, hey, uh, who's your band? Who do you love? Like, you're at all these shows every day, you know, granted your backs to it, but you're hearing it. Mm-hmm. And he said, I like Pearl Jam. And I was like, really? And he said, yeah. So... I came around uh, next time around and I bought a print that I had shot of Eddie Vedder leaping off of uh, scaffolding silhouetted against the sky. And I was like, here, man, I got something for you. And I gave him this print. And he was, he was like, oh, man, this is great. Thank you so much. Now, your initial instinct, which is right as well, is to give some to the artist so they can see that you're a good photographer. But don't forget about the publicist who got you there. Don't forget about the, the guitar tech who let you get in that little spot on the stage. Yeah. So as... Um, now I run into Daryl and Daryl's like, you can stay a little longer over here. You can do that. I'm like, oh, did you know that they're going to walk in on this side? Maybe you'll get them before they go on the stage, all that. So fa- fast forward a couple of years and I'm shooting the Dave Matthews band for uh, some album packaging in San Francisco. And uh, the band, the van pulls up with the band and you know we're at this location. And who climbs out of the car first but Daryl? So Daryl, who was like a front of house guy in the security team, had become friends with Dave Matthews band. They saw that he was really good at what he did. He's their guy. And now he's still their guy. And it's all like, it's all becomes a circle of, you know, then the idea of treat everybody the way you want to be treated, because if you don't, it's going to bite you in the ass when it comes around. And if you do, people are going to be like, Hey, I remember that guy. He was great. Like, let's give him this opportunity. And that's why you don't screw people on the road because, and, and that's, um, once you're on the road, the great thing is it's a family. Everybody knows everybody. Yeah. Within two calls, you can get to pretty much anybody. So once the the, the fraternity of the, the 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 guitar techs and all of those guys, if once you befriend, I've befriended a plenty of them because they're great guys. They also make for good photos too, with the beards and the tattoos and everything else they have. But what you were saying there reminded me of a story Bob Gruen was talking about when when uh, what's Tina Turner and Ike Turner, somebody, his friend pushed him in front of Ike and said, show here, show him the photo. And he showed him the photo, took him back to see Tina. And then that's how he got in with, with, with her. And that was, that was cool stuff. It's not too shabby. No. So how important is assisting? I I think it's huge. I do. Um, you know, there come, there can be people who can get, get passed without it. Um, but I think, you know, for me, I went to school uh, to a community college for two years, and then I went to New England School of Photography in Boston. And it was a great school for me. It was uh, learn how to process film, learn how to print. Here's some some classes on to give you a general outline on advertising and journalism and whatever, you know, that sort of thing. And, uh, and it was great for me. But then taking that and going into assisting – was huge. My first uh, assisting job was I had I had saved up my money after I got out of school and I went to some photographic workshops, which were awesome because you're in, surrounded by people who love photography. You choose the, sh- the workshop with the instructors you love, and the instructor there was Annie Leibovitz, mm. and I ended up getting a job as an intern with her and working my way up to being one of her assistants. How how'd that happen? <clears throat> um, you know, I got there to the workshop and her assistant was there, and you know, workshops are great. There's a lot of variety of people there. You know, some people are never going to be more than a hobbyist. 
and uh, some people are going to try and go places. Right. And I think, um, you know, I hit it off with her assistant and about like three quarters of the way through the workshop, he said, I've been speaking with Annie and she told me to keep my eyes open for someone as an intern at the studio. And uh, we think that you might be the guy, you know, are you interested? And, um, and I was like, yeah, for sure. Uh, and so um, I ended up, you know, sweeping floors and getting coffee and running errands and all that sort of stuff and just slowly built my way up. And, and it opened a lot of doors for me. And it also, you know, of course, when I was doing it, it's like yeah, I wanted to be Annie Leibovitz. I mean, who wouldn't? You know, you want to get out there. She's got great concepts and she's shooting presidents and she's shooting, you know, musicians and yeah. poets and movie stars. And it's, it's awesome. And I think everybody asked me what my takeaway from, from, from her was. And, you know, part of it was how to work with the subject and how to not take no for an answer and how to get what you want done in an efficient way and working harder than ever. Uh, but I also learned that I realized that, you know, I wasn't Annie, you know, <laughs> it took me a while to, to let go of it and say, you know, I have my own personality. I have my own likes. I have my own ways of working and I have to embrace that. So when I got out of there and when I worked with other photographers, I worked with Mary Ellen Mark. I worked with Lynn Goldsmith. I worked with, um, Stephen Mizell for quite some time, which was an awesome experience. Yeah. And, um, and a guy named Timothy White. And Timothy was a great mentor and is a great mentor of mine. He is a guy who is just a hustler beyond belief and is the go-to guy for photographing celebrities and doing movie posters and all that. And we became great friends and we both love motorcycles and cars and, and all that. Um, but the thing is, is when you get to a point where you're trying to d discover your style, uh, you, I started to stress out, like, what is my style? Like, hey, oh, my style, like, you know, how am I going to present my work in a way that's like cohesive, but still maybe um, diverse enough to get different jobs? And, and I realized, you know, in a nutshell, it's basically, I liked shooting with, uh, a tri -X, you know, and I liked my old Nikon at the time. I, I just, I didn't have my Leica yet, but I liked tri -X. I liked a wide lens. I liked to be in the middle of things. I liked atmosphere. I liked cars and motorcycles and rock and roll. And, you know, and I just said, well, there it's right there. I mean, it's right in my face, you know, black and white wide in your face, captured moments, cars, rock and roll, hip hop, you know, and it just, that's, it sort of just, it told me what my style was. You yeah. Know? And you have to, re, you have to remind yourself so you can discover it and let it happen naturally. And of course, you know, as you develop more, you, you, like you said earlier, I start to experiment after doing the same thing, you know, we're moving into color and moving into the studio and trying a four by five camera to slow myself down and not be so worried about capturing the moment in the atmosphere. Like I did all those things to help myself grow. Yeah. I was trying to figure out your style, not figure it out, but when I'm looking through the new book, um, I was just like the, the shots that they don't seem, they have a, 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 they feel like you had an idea to, it's sort of like a setup, but it's still candid. It just seems like, you know, you got the black keys driving in a car. It's like, let's go drive and I'm going to shoot photos. So it, it still has the, the, document, the documentary style of images there. Yeah. And I absolutely love how the book is set up because you have, you have the documentation, you've got your family stuff, you've got the, uh, the live. So it, it's broken down and, it, and it, puts, it puts everything where it belongs, I think. It, but it's still loose. You know, that's what I like about it, too. And some of them, like the portraits, could go into the friends and family or the or the documentary and they kind of overlap in a way, but it was nice to section it out and give a little bit of structure to it. And, um, my friend Stefan Nedzvetsky, who did the design for the book, um, has a company called yard and we do all the Varvado stuff together. We've been doing it for together for many, many uh, seasons. And he's a big music fan, but his style is very, uh, he's super styly guy. He's really smart and his stuff is very, um, clean and um, not always, but you know, it's organized and it's well thought out and it's very classic. And I feel like my work has a classic side only I'm more messy and loose and kind of, you know, messy and loose, I guess. And I thought what a great combination 
to, to do this book together. Yeah. And, uh, and it was, it ended up falling in the right place. And he's also a guy, he's not like a yes guy. You know, I'd, I'd said, he said, give me 400 images, you know, and I'll start to look through them. And I gave him like 1200 and he was like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I love all these images. Just start kicking them around, pairing them up. And we would go meet and we'd have everything up on a, on a foam cores and we would start to, um, put the layout together. Yeah. And, uh, and so, um, he really, and also he was a guy that would say to me, um, you know, look, I know you had a great time taking that photo and I know you like Bruce Springsteen, but you know, that's not the best photo, mm. you know? And I would be like, well, I'd either say, well, okay. Or I'd say like, well, I'm not going to budge on this one. I love this one. And he goes, okay, but I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's he letting say, you know. I'd be like, thanks buddy. Well, at, least, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Because that, that's the tough thing though. It's like. I know people go to portfolio reviews and they have these people they pay to review their stuff and then they're giving them all the tips and they're like, but I don't agree with that. I love this image. I'm like, if you love the image, it's your book. Put out there what you want to put. That's one person's opinion. Right. There's another, like you could show it to the next person. They could tell you the exact opposite. So get everybody's opinion, put it in your mind. Absorb it. And, and then decide what works for you from there. So you were showing us some of the Blind Melon stuff. Is, yeah. is the Kickstarter still going for that? No, it's done. We raised about almost $115,000. And um, it, was, uh, a really, it was a really interesting process. I had never done one. And we got about halfway through, and we were still like, you know, 65% shy yeah. of uh, the money we needed. And... You know, we had a lot of ideas in our back pocket and we offered a lot of uh, incentives and things like that that were unique. And I had a little idea to reach out to some bands that I had met along the way who surprised me by saying, oh, Blind Melon was, I love Blind Melon, yeah. a huge influence on me. I often find myself defending them because people are like, oh yeah, the B girl and the No Rain. And I'm like, yeah, but... You know, yeah. and uh, and and I met people like Jim James and the Avit brothers, um, uh, uh, Nicole Atkins, Joseph Arthur, um, and Brian Fallon from the Gaslight Anthem, and they they all were like, I love Blind Melon. I mean, this is what we listened to when I was coming up, and you know, his voice is so unique, and his writing was so unique, and 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 that sort of thing. And so I reached out to them and asked them if they would cut a Blind Melon song so that we could launch it and bring their fans to the table as well. Yeah. Uh, and to, um, and encourage people, you know? Um, so, uh, they did Jim James did the first one and, um, Seth Aphit. Everybody did one. Joseph Arthur, who's one of my dear friends, um, was on tour and was, um, um, uh, he always supports me, but was unable to do uh, one this time around. But again, you know, these are people who, who love the band and they ended up releasing these things and getting them out there and it generated its own buzz. And even in the press, people were just talking about that yeah. and that was drawing people in. And so at the end of the day, when I thought I might need a little help from, you know, angels on the, uh, on the wings where we were saying, look, if I'm 10 grand short, can, you know, we cut a deal where you, you know, and I had people in, who were offering to do that, and we didn't need to. Which is great. Which is great. And now we're just in the process of um, of just, you know, accumulating everything that we need uh, and renting a new space and starting to just actually finish watching the footage because there's so much of it. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, the, what what struck me with, with the images, well, I'm drawn to the ground-out negative carrier. Um, I remember when, when I graduated from college, my entire portfolio, so it happened to be a sports portfolio, it was all hockey because I was shooting the Flyers back then and everything was ground out. And I know that I would take that to the Flyers game and show these professional photographers and they'd be like, what's this black border? And I'm like, huh? I'm like, that's a full frame. And I'm like, none of this is cropped. And that's something I never understood. A lot of people just, they, they especially in sports, they crop. But what, what's your reasoning for not cropping? You know, I think when I worked for Annie Leibovitz, she... I did. I printed for her as well, and she had the filed out carrier, and she had. But if she didn't do the filed out carrier, she was still printing full frame, right to the border. Right. And I just honestly, I don't think I overthought it. I think that I saw that she was doing it, and I thought that's what a photographer with integrity does. Fill they the get frame. in there, and they fill the frame up, and they. And you know, 
Mary Ellen Mark you know, cropping in mm. here and Annie and like just really creating that tension, natural tension around the photograph. And uh, it's just the way I shoot and the way it is. I mean, um, you know, it's a little kind of easier now when you're, you know, in the in a digital space and, you know, you see like a, there's some weird something at the end of the frame um, that to take out, you know, and um, I mean, I'm not going to be like overly ridiculous about it. You know, I'll crop in on something if I if I feel like it's going to make the photograph better. Sure. Um, but my theory is frame it up in the camera and put a black border around it because that black border holds it in. It, yeah. it shows that like when you are looking through the frame, like, you know, this is your moment. This is when you click the shutter and this is what was in the frame. And, you know, it's it's great. And sometimes those mistakes or things that appear like they're in the way are what really gives the photograph its flavor. Right. Now, you, you talked about shooting the black and white film. Uh, do you still shoot a lot of film? I do. I shoot a lot less film. Um, for example, I just did a shoot for Rolling Stone um, this past weekend. And, you know, it's a magazine. They're on a deadline. You know, um, so I shot mostly digital, but I still shot about like, uh, how many rolls of film did I shoot, Dan? For what? For, for the Rolling Stone thing. For Mumford? Yeah. No, five. Five. Five rolls of film. Right. But, you know, it's funny that true. Oh, yeah. I did a shoot with Don Henley recently. I shot 40 rolls of film, which mm-hmm. felt great. And the other thing is that the film cameras are the ones that you can, I mean, you can do double exposures and stuff digitally. I do that a lot too. It's fun. But, you know, you can't really fake like a Diana right. or like a Wide Lux or something. You just can't, yeah. you know. And it's also when you have it in your hand and the artist sees that Wide Lux, it's like, what is that? And it you just know? opens up the, yeah. it just opens them up and, and, sure, and they like, just wow. relax. Yeah, this guy's like, you know, he's bringing some interesting stuff to the table. This should be exciting. I'm they're they're looking forward to seeing it because they they get so used to being shot by the same people over. Well, not yeah. the same people, but the there's there's a lot the of standard. the standard like I'm shooting for a blog and let me just take some pictures, right? And you you know you can tell the disconnect between certain photographers and and, and certain bands. But sure. um, what what are you rocking these days? Well, um, I like my favorite um, thing to do. Is to go with uh, this Leica M, which I really love. Uh, I've had it for about a year. Um, and then I have a, an M6 and an M4P. And I do, I rotate the M6 and the M4P if one needs to, if I've beaten one up for a while and it needs to go in and get cleaned, I just swap it out. Um, so I'll have a film Leica. I'll have my digital Leica, the M. And then I'll have like a 35 millimeter lens and a 75 so i got the 75 on the film camera and then if i need to switch it out i do that so i feel like i'm really covering all the bases you know a wide lens a longer lens i don't really like to shoot with much longer lens although sometimes it's necessary when you're shooting a concert right um and then uh if i'm and this that's when i'm rolling kind of casual and i've been rolling a lot with just the m which has been fun also i like the 35 millimeter summicron and I just I just roll around with that, and I could live my life with this camera, uh, and be pretty happy. Yeah. Um, but I've noticed that uh, the one disadvantage to the M is when you put the longer lens on it, the 75, you can't really focus with the uh, with the rangefinder. Mm. It's kind of weird, and it's I hope they fix that in the future. Yeah, it's, it's a but, Leica. That's it's supposed yeah. to be difficult. Yeah. yeah. Well. Um, but I also shoot with a 5D. A lot. And then my other cameras that I shoot with are, um, I have some old Nikons, the FEs. I have a Hasselblad. Uh, I have a Wide Lux, a Diana, an old Fuji half frame. Mm. Um, I have the, uh, the Hasselblad um, uh, panoramic camera. Um, and then I have also the Holga. I said the Diana. I have a Konica Instapress, which is the Polaroid pull and peel, mm-hmm. which I absolutely love. I shoot with that all the time. And um, 
I have, um, I think, uh, what else do I got? I got like some, you know, the old, we used to call it the golf swing camera, which is the four, the plastic camera that spins. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you shoot with that and it's all sorts of happy accidents happen. Yeah. Those things, so those things were creative. That's pretty fun. Yeah. So the, when was there the transition to, you know, you have your stills, mm-hmm. but then moving into moving pictures? Yeah. Uh, again, it kind of comes back to Robert Frank and Danny Lyon and my love of film, but knowing that those guys who I really admired um, were making films also. And I thought, wow, that's that's pretty cool. And their films were like pretty experimental. I mean, especially Robert Frank's. And I thought, I don't know, I like that. I like that idea. And and um, I, had, I have no film making uh training necessarily and i decided to check it out and i did like some small music videos for some friends of mine and then i did a documentary with ben harper called pleasure and pain which was my first documentary and i just i just went out with blind and just started shooting everything and trying to craft a story around uh, this guy and his his career and where he had come from and, and that was a really great experience um, and, uh, 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 my friend, Sam Lee, a woman named Sam, Sam Lee started as the editor and then became the co-director because she was so instrumental in schooling me on how to like make a film and not miss certain elements and leave them, you know, cause you leave a big gap if you, if you miss certain things in the storytelling process, it's not like a photograph where right. you're getting one thing you're, you're trying to like tell the story in a different way. And so that was a great learning experience for me. All right. So what's uh, what's coming up next for you? Like, what what are you looking most forward to? Um, well, I'm going to Bonnaroo, which is always fun. I'll do the portrait thing, and uh, and actually, I'm not doing any other filming. This is the first time in literally like probably 12 years that I'm only doing the portrait and just kind of running around documenting. So I'm super excited about that. Um, I am. I just did uh, the uh, little short film and the publicity and album packaging for the new My Morning Jacket record, uh, which is an amazing record. I just did four videos for the new Alabama Shakes Sound and Color record, which is amazing. I mean, the band is so timeless, and they're just really on top of their game. It's really great stuff. I just did something with Don Henley. He has a solo record, and that's like uh, album packaging and then like a little documentary about where he is in his life at this time and what, why he made this particular record. Um, I'm going to a, uh, I think I'm going to go to a photo, uh, a, uh, a, a harmonica workshop mm. down in Mississippi, uh, which is going to be really fun. And um, you know, um, we just did, um, I work with um, Milk Films uh, as a production company out of LA, and we just did something for John Varvados. He's got like a fragrance uh, that's coming out. I do a lot of the John Varvados ads. Right. And um, I did the photography for that, and I also did the um, uh, the moving image part of it as well. So we're working on that. I also just did the new video for Zach Brown, band which uh, just came out uh, I did the album packaging and I did the video which is really super cool uh, that's out right now and then I also have um, this book um, I mean you know this one because you reviewed it and I loved your review I really did. It was awesome. oh, you saw it Nice. So this is a book called Motor Drive, right? Mm. So it's uh, photographs of musicians and their cars, uh, motorcycles, whatever it might be, right? So um, you getting a glare on that? No, 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 you're good. You good? You're good on that. Uh, Motor Drive. So I, a friend of mine, Alex Nowak, um, is an is a uh, creative director and a great great guy, uh, lover of rock and roll and uh, and photography, and he was over here one day and we were kicking the tires on some ideas about like oh what, you know what can we do to, let's do something together, so we came up with this idea just sitting around here at the table with some wine and whatever, so I gave him a bunch of images, 
and he went to town on this thing. We decided we would do um, the cover in the the material that they used for the old car seats in the yeah. 70s. Um, and we're what we're doing is um, we're doing. Um, let's see if it's probably better that way. We're doing um, 340, a limited edition of 340, which is the connotation is Tom Morello has a Dodge Demon, a 71 Dodge Demon, and it's got a 340 mm. uh, 8 V8 motor in there. And so we decided to do 340 of them. They'll be n- numbered, uh, editioned, and signed, and all nice. that kind of stuff. And then um, uh, <clears throat> there's my dad. You know, when I grew, I grew up around cars and motorcycles. Um, and then we have uh, the the forward is written by by uh, Tom Morello, um, Bruce Springsteen. Like, so what I do is I write a little bit of a story about the photograph on some of them. Um, but this story in particular is really sweet. Uh, I had done the album packaging for uh, Bruce's record called Wrecking Ball uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, while we were, after we did the, the session, he invited me out into his car to listen to the record. Mm. And he's like, yeah, I'll play you a couple of songs. And I said, oh, great. So we go out there. Of course, he couldn't just play me a couple. He played me the entire record and was you know turning the volume down and telling me a little story about oh this is why i did this here and like i got this producer and this is why and we found this woman to to sing some backup and it was just an amazing experience and yeah happening in a car is like it's such a cool uh vibe but i got the black keys and then like public enemy with their hot rods um let's see what else we got here uh mick fleetwood in hawaii with his little uh, austin healy uh, my my buddy's um, old Triumph from when I I took this. This is an old photo, but I love it for the dead thing. Um, Seth Avit. So the whole thing, Tom Waits in the reflection in the hood of his car. Yeah. So we thought it would be cool, and it really it's become a really interesting little piece to have, and uh, ah, I'm cool super stuff. excited about it. No, they're, they're awesome. I and, love this stuff. And they're, you know, they're not, I try not to be typical with it, you know, but there's only so many ways you can shoot it, uh, a, a car, but I think I found some ways to keep it interesting. And, but it's cool with the, yeah. it's the people and the car yeah. and the stories behind it. Right. And why is it that car and like, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's what so. makes it awesome. Yeah. This is one of the more abstract ones. This is Bruce Springsteen shot through the wheel of a, of a motorcycle mm. with uh, some other stuff there. So awesome. Um, oh, and this is me. With my 68 Firebird. Nice. And my feathered back hairdo. In Jersey. In New Jersey. Very cool. So that's that. Um, this is um, uh, a book I made of um, all those pull and peel with my Konica. I was telling yeah. you about that Konica camera. And this is like, you know, a happy accident where the chemistry didn't didn't land right. Right. And it just it didn't read. So it's, not a, it's not a filter, you know. It's no. not, you just didn't hit a button and then. Right. And this <laughs> is all natural framing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you know, Keith Richards, Bonnie Vare. Nice. Ah, those are, that pull and peel is awesome. <coughs> God, sorry. That's all good. It, it mm. gives you such an... You said you scanned the back of uh, what was left. Yeah, and there's like fingerprints on it and all kinds of craziness. That makes it awesome. Mm. So... There was this festival in New Jersey this weekend. The Mumford and Sons did like Gentlemen of the Road. Right. And my, my blues band, the Tangiers Blues Band, played <clears throat> played uh, the late night show. And um, Taylor from Dawes came and jammed with us. And the, Ted and uh, Chris from um, Mumford and Sons. And then I I sang some songs, and I don't I don't usually sing too often, so I I totally shredded my my voice. And, throat uh, coat. It was sure was worth it, though. No, nah, mm. that's awesome. Anyway, really cool. So yeah, double exposure. Oh. This happened in camera. So this was right in. I just clicked it. I didn't pull it, and then I switched the light to the other side, uh. and and so this is a natural, you know, happy accident where this kind of dissected there. And that's great. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. So when when can we expect the book? Um, this book is almost done. We're we're basically um, it's printing right now. And we actually hand stamped this in, so we have a uh, we have a branding kind of iron sure. with this built into it. 
just press. Stamp it down, Boom. you know. And how's this bad boy doing? <clears throat> it's just doing great. I'm telling you, I probably have about 11,000 of those out in the world. And um, I spoke to the Abrams people uh, who published the book, and they said they couldn't be happier and that there's no returns on the book. And oftentimes when they put a lot of books out there, that's, you know, if they're not selling, they get returned. And, um, I mean, I've sold, I've done a bunch of book signings and uh, I've had these certain parties and stuff and I've just sold, sold a bunch of them. And I mean, I think what I'm most proud of, uh, with this book and, uh, is, is that, you know, people, you never want to really be pigeonholed in your photography. Like, you know, of course I wanted to be Annie Leibovitz or Irving Penn or Avedon where you're like, Oh, you're shooting, you know, um, a president and an author and an actor and a fashion spread and a this and a that. And I've gotten to do like a lot of that stuff. Um, but you know, being a music photographer, so to speak, or being known as people have said, you know, Oh, the right, this guy's the rock and roll photographer, you know? And I, I try to remind them, you know, what I'm most proud of is that I actually got my start in hip hop mm. and I did the Nas Illmatic record. I did Kanye's first record. I did Red Man and Public Enemy and LL Cool J and all that. And that led to all of the um, alternative bands, let's just say, uh, who all loved Public Enemy and saw my portfolio. And then that's how I ended up working with the Smashing Pumpkins and Blind Melon and you know, chili peppers and all that sort of stuff because they're all fans of that work as well. And then it just went from there to then it's like Bruce Springsteen and Neil Young and then Tony Bennett and Willie Nelson and Johnny Cash. Mm -hmm. So you've got Metallica over here and you've got Tony Bennett over here and everything that's in between. And it's, it's been really a great ride for me and it's been very exciting to interact with all those people and have the, all those great life experiences yeah. that, um, I can hold on to. And, and, um, <clears throat> And then this is the proof of that. So that's an awesome really book. Super, super exciting. And I know a lot of people. You can pick it up on Amazon. Still moving. Danny Clinch. It's awesome. Yeah. Danny, thank you for taking the time. Yeah, man. Enjoy the Bonnaroo and enjoy whatever else is coming up next. Thanks. You're welcome.